Hello everyone, this is Peter Moyle. I'm a professor of fish biology at the University of California at Davis, where I'm also affiliated with the Center for Watershed Sciences and the Department of Wildlife, Fish, and Conservation Biology. Uh, I've been working with the freshwater fishes of California since 1969. Um, and, and my work involves a lot of field work. That is a lot of time out sampling fish in various places. And more recently, I've been deeply involved in trying to find out what's going on uh, in relation to the drought. And today I want to talk to you about droughts, climate change, and dams, reconciling a future for California's native inland fishes. Basically, I want to start out talking a little about drought and native fishes and why this is an issue, and then bring in climate change, because really drought today is doing what we expect climate change to do in the long run, making it much more difficult for fish to survive. But I'm being an optimistic person. I really want to talk about what we can do, uh, uh, get into a conservation strategy of sorts, and then put this in the context, context of something that, that I'm very fond of these days, which is reconciliation ecology. Um, well, you've all heard about the drought, if you, especially if you've been listening to other seminars in this series. Uh, this just shows you the, uh, the drought map of California, where they uh, the entire state's basically in, in moderate to uh, exceptional drought. The darkest part is more exceptional drought. We're in the third year of a drought. Uh, if you may remember, and from 2013 to 2014, we went a whole year with virtually no rain. Uh, and this was all very hard on the fish, as you might expect. Um, so what does this drought really mean for the fish in general of California? Well, there's, of course, less water below dams, uh, and the water below the dams is warmer as well. This is because there's just really less water to release. Uh, if you cut back on downstream demands for water, you will release less water from the dams. And generally, what you, from a fish perspective, what you want is the dams to be releasing water from as deep down in their pool as they can uh, to, so the water's fairly cold. Well, here's a picture of the American River last January. Uh, what you see is a uh, trickle across what had been a major river, and the lower, lower picture shows the reservoir from which it's drained, drained, which was very low at the time. Or it also means there's habitat loss and fragmentation as small streams dry up and as they lose their connection to other streams. These are some pictures I took just last week uh, on the Navarro River, two tributaries, one is Flynn Creek, which is a coho salmon uh, rearing stream, obviously it's dry, and, and the Indian Creek, which is another important stream in the watershed, which looks today like it normally does in September or October at the end of the dry season. Or more recently, this, this present week, I was up on hunting in Davis Creeks up in the uh, upper part of the Pewter Creek watershed, and here you see dry streams. And because Hunting Creek has always been a creek I've loved going to because it had a nice diversity of native fishes in it and was quite accessible. And you see here just a few little pools left and they'll be gone in a few weeks, I'm sure. So this is a creek that normally is a perennial stream is now dry. And this of course means you have major die-offs of fish in many, many areas as the streams dry up and a great fragmentation of the population. So you have to if you lose fish from a watershed and you want them back again, they have to be able to recolonize from someplace else. There has to be a refuge for them. And an additional problem these fish face is the alien fish invasions. Basically, we have 50 species of non-native fishes in California, and many of them thrive in warm altered habitats, such as reservoirs and ponds. Uh, and these are habitats that the na our native fishes don't do well in. So the, native, it's, the droughts give alien fishes a new advantage in invading our systems. And a good example of this is what happened during the 1987 through 94 drought. It really wasn't a drought as severe as this one, in many respects, a series of dry years. But because the outflows from the Delta got very low in the estuary, we had a series of invasions that changed the whole system. The overbite clam, Brazilian waterweed, Humophiri gobi, a bunch of copepods, some of these these organisms were already present uh, in the system, but it's only when the system became saltier and more stressed did these critters get a chance to take off, uh, in part, I suspect, because the native populations were depressed. 
And it also coincided with increased diversion. So this is always a problem we have with drought situations. We're also manipulating our waterways very extensively, even without drought. So these invaders were given an advantage not only by the drought, but by what we were doing to the, to the uh, watersheds. So why is there so much concern about drought and its effects on native fishes? Well, first off, these are the native fishes of California are California fishes. 79% are found only in the California regions. That's of 129 species. Uh, and 60% are found in California alone. They're endemic to our state. And another 19% are found in Oregon or Nevada, but generally it's very small populations on the limits of their range. Uh, so if we want our native fishes around, we've got to protect them here in California. There's no refuges for them outside the state. And well, even without drought, 80% of our native fishes are in decline. Uh, and 23% are already listed as threatened or endangered species. So you can, this means that what I'm telling you is not just my own opinion, but it reflects a reality that the agencies uh, have uh, come to as well. And more and more species are being listed all the time. And we know extinction happens. These are two species that have already been lost from California. The thick-tailed chub, once one of the most abundant fish in the Delta, disappeared in the 1950s. Uh, the bull trout, a, a, a wonderful game fish, disappeared from California in the 1970s. In fact, one of my graduate students caught the last one known in the state. Well, the cause of native fish declines, even without drought, is this what I call the one-two punch. The first thing is habitat loss and degradation. We, you know, we remove a lot of the water from our streams. We dam up our streams, we dry them up, we send the water out in canals. Uh, and fish are generally a low priority <clears throat> in the way we manage our waterways. So we degrade the habitat, and then we introduce the alien fishes, as I mentioned, and they f they're favored by these altered habitats. So these native fishes have a lot to contend with, even without drought, if they're going to survive. And curiously enough, though, uh, native fishes are, in fact, drought adapted. You think of this area we live in with a Mediterranean climate. Uh, the typical year involves uh, all the precipitation coming down in the winter and then long, hot, dry summers with very little rain. So there's naturally annual droughts, and we also had longer droughts in the past. And these fish show this adaptations to live under these conditions. They're long-lived, they have high fecundity, so when that good times come back, they can really produce a lot of young. They disperse very rapidly in, <clears throat> into formerly dry habitats, so they can... Uh, colonize new areas very quickly. Even our salmon in California have multiple runs in year classes. Uh, they spend multiple years in fresh water or in salt water, so they have lots of alternatives uh, uh, over, over a series of dry years. And there, these fish are also designed to take advantage of refuges. These refuges may be spring-fed streams or the high upstream reaches that to get snowmelt, the large rivers, pools in uh, some dry small streams. There's a whole air bunch of places these fish can survive, even under extreme conditions, survive through uh, drought, periods of drought. Here's an example, uh, a place I just visited last week, or actually this week, um, I'm sorry, last Tuesday. Um, this is a uh, small tributary stream in, in Lake County. Uh, it's up in a very hot, dry canyon. It was 107 degrees out when we happened to visit, and the water seemed almost that warm. It's just this little pool, of, series of little pools of waters in this rocky canyon, and it, they, yet they contain this native fish called the California roach, which can live under these extreme conditions. And under normal circumstances, refuges like this, perhaps little bigger ones, would keep this fish going through the summer. And even, indeed, even in this area, the, the deepest pool here was about a meter deep. It's quite likely these fish will survive through this summer because this is a, like a bathtub and it's fairly well shaded by the big rocks. Uh, but what's been going on with our human presence here is California is now in a perpetual drought, severe drought from a native fish perspective. When you have natural droughts, the, the, the good times come again. Increasingly, we're not allowing those good times to happen for our native fish. 
Streams that come dewatered semi-permanently or at least with a lot lower flows, they become warmer. Access to refuges is denied because of dams and other uh, aspects of the way we manage the rivers so the fish cannot get to the areas that might keep them going through a drought. And then we add the competition from non-native species that really uh, make it difficult for these fish to survive. And that's why we always have to talk about climate change as drought being an example of, of what's, what's going to happen as climate changes. And it's all, as, I, as I'm sure you know, climate change is already happening. Uh, this um, picture on the top here is of the Potrero Hills near Susun Marsh where I do a lot of work. And taken in Jan end of January of this year when the hills, what would normally be bright green, were dark brown from being so dry. And of course, the carbon dioxide has continued to rise in the atmosphere, uh, and the human populations are continuing to grow. So this means climate change is more and more of a reality. And this is not good for fish, or of course, it's not good for people either. But the, the, if present trends, can, this is all about if present trends continue. And we'll always have to emphasize that it's all about whether or not we want, really want to do something about these issues or not. Well, the predicted effects of climate change on aquatic systems are as follows. First, there'll be changes in precipitation patterns, the way rain and snow falls, changes in stream flows, increases in water temperature in general, because air temperatures are increasing, and increases in the severity of droughts and floods. All these things will be happening on, on a more frequent basis. Let's look at precipitation, for example. The models about climate change vary quite a bit in this, but in the, the increasingly the conclusion seems to be that there will be less annual precipitation on average. We don't know how much less, uh, uh, and, but we, the general configura configuration of these patterns is that droughts will become more severe and probably more frequent. Uh, it's figured that precipitation will become more variable that is with our Mediterranean patterns, longer, hotter summers, for example. And most precipitation will occur in the winter and spring. And increasingly, this precipitation will occur as rain rather than snow. You know, one of our biggest reservoirs in California is the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. A lot of that's going to be lost, so this water will come down quickly in the winter rather than being held as snow to melt slowly. This makes a huge difference to our streams. So this is what was likely to happen to stream flows. Again, this is the major habitat for our native fishes. They become more variable. The peak flows in some years will become larger because of the snowmelt issues. Uh, and they all occur earlier in the year because it's warmer. The base flows, that is the late summer flows, will become longer and they'll become lower. So this is a, going to become a tough environment for fish to live in. This is an example of a, of a predicted flow pattern from the Salmon River in the Klamath Basin. What you'll notice in that the, the dotted line shows the altered flows versus the solid line, which is historic flows, and the altered flows are definitely uh, show you the peaks being earlier, and then if you go all the way up to September, the, the, the flows being lower. So it's, it's hard for fish. And as temperatures, it will increase four to six degrees on average in the air temperature, and, and somewhere in that same neighborhood for increases in water temperatures, although this depends on stream elevation and size. But it does mean that lethal temperatures will occur more often. This is a photograph of the big salmon kill that occurred on the Klamath River due to an unfortunate series of circumstances, but basically related to low flows and high temperatures that killed thousands of salmon. Uh, so we'll end up having a large loss of cold water. By cold water, I mean water that's gener generally less than 20 degrees centigrade in summer. Um, and these cold water habitats will have to ship, shift northwards and then upward in the watersheds uh, to f to, in order to have places for our native fishes to live. And the warmer streams in general will favor non-native species. And these droughts then will show us what happens to our native fishes as climate changes. This, we learn from today what's going to happen tomorrow, essentially. Uh, and one way we've done this systematically, this is a paper uh, a group of us just published uh, last year on the climate change vulnerability uh, to, um, of fishes, California fishes. Uh, and we evaluated the vulnerability to extinction in the next 100 years with our 121 native fishes and 43 uh, non-native fishes. 
And basically what we found was that about half of the native fishes are already rated as critically or highly vulnerable to extinction, even without climate change. Um, but most non-native species were rated as low vulnerability to extinction without climate change. But when you add climate change to the equation, you find that the numbers jump up to 82% of the native fishes. added. So this graphs the bars on the left-hand side, or the critically vulnerable and highly vulnerable species, uh, species are on the, my left, I guess you're right. And um, uh, it shows that the native fishes are going to be doing very badly under, as present trends continue under, under climate change, whereas the aliens will, will do much better. And in fact, some alien species will actually benefit from these changes. So this means most native fishes have a severe decline or extinction in the next 100 years, while alien fishes will become more abundant, things like carp and red shiners and largemouth bass. But that, again, I emphasize if present trends continue. Uh, so what can we do? This is always the question when you are faced with severe news like this. I mean, it is grim uh, what the future we're looking at for native fishes. Uh, it's grim because of the increased human use of water combined with the natural changes that will be taking place from uh, the results of climate change. Uh, and uh, the first thing I recommend everybody do is get well informed. And I can recommend a book that I'm a co-author of called Managing California's Water from Conflict to Reconciliation. It's actually published by the Public Policy Institute of California. And it's available free online, so I really recommend it. Go to PPIC uh, on your computer and you can download it. it it's a well-written, with good graphics, uh, uh, summary of water problems uh, in California, written by a bunch of very knowledgeable people. Uh, but to make this work, well, to make this knowledge useful, you, we have to develop a statewide strategy for aquatic conservation. Right now our conservation is fragmented. We do a bit here and there. We look at individual streams. Uh, when you're faced with a big issues like climate change, you have to deal with them in a big way. And this means developing statewide plans for conservation especially aquatic conservation. And this makes a lot of sense because our political boundaries and the biological boundaries do coincide in California. So we have to protect examples of all major habitats. We need self-sustaining populations of all native fishes uh, and they need drought protection. Those are some of the goals that we should be looking at for a statewide plan. Right now, not much of our aquatic habitat is protected. If you look at this map here, the areas in green are protected habitats that are in wilderness areas, national parks, and things of this nature. And what you see, most um, protected areas are either in the high mountains, where there are not many fish, or they're on deserts, where there are virtually no fish. Where you have a lot of fish, that is the darker places in the background here, you tend not to have protected areas. So fish and aquatic organisms in general are not well protected by our present system of reserves. So some key components then of this statewide uh, conservation have to be native fish rescue facilities, so emergency rooms for fish, uh, a database, and so forth. Now I'll go through these uh, one at a time. First off, native fish rescue facilities. During droughts, we are going to have periods of time when some species of fish will need to be physically rescued if they're going to survive. And we need to have facilities that are dedicated to keeping some of these fish around. Um, there, there's a proposed facility at Rio Vista, for example, for delta fishes that includes the delta smelt, which is, has a, but now has a backup population in captivity. We need to repurpose trout hatcheries or build ponds and other facilities statewide that, that can be used for these purposes. In other words, have backup populations of these fish or places we can fit, put fish if there's an emergency uh, extinction event going on. Uh, Another thing that's important is a statewide database. So we just developed here at UC Davis that is going to be used by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is a statewide database of where fish are found today and where they've been found in the past. Um, we've got a, a basic database going already and we're continually improving it. But this is the information that can be the foundation for any statewide conservation strategy. For example, you could do things like this. This is a map we generated that shows uh, the 
conservation status of fish in 1975 when I did an evaluation versus what, the, what it's like in 2010, or really what it's like today. Um, and what you see is all the green is fish, where the fish populations are in good condition, and the darker, the, the red is where they're in the worst condition. And what you see is that there's a lot of green in 1975, not much green in 2010, and increasing amounts of red uh, and, and brown uh, through the decades. And that's only you know, a 35 year period. That suggests our, our fish fauna is in rapid decline. So, but part of the strategy has to be protect the best habitats that are left, and there are still some out there. Uh, one of my favorites is Blue Creek, where I've been working with the Nature Conservancy, uh, I'm sorry, we're working with the Western Rivers Conservancy, who in turn have a partnership with the Yurok Tribe to make uh, Blue Creek into the Yurok Tribal Salmon Sanctuary. This is a tributary of the Klamath River. It supports all the major kinds of fish in the, um, uh, uh, in the Klamath Basin, and it is truly a beautiful spot. Uh, and, the, and then the, uh, the part of the strategy has to be re to restore areas. For example, this is a project that we, uh, our watershed center has in, in, with the Nature Conservancy to evaluate uh, the restoration of a couple of, of Big Springs Creek, a tributary to the Shasta River. Formerly, it had been on private ranch land, uh, and cows actually grazed in the stream, which is very hard on the fish, especially the salmon. Uh, in March, the uh, one of the, this ranch was acquired in, by the Nature Conservancy in 2009, and almost immediately, once you got the cows out, you fenced the stream and got the cows out, the vegetation started to recovery, and then the, the salmon started coming back. Today, it is an important salmon stream once again. Still got some problems because of downstream issues, but this is an example of where some, uh, the, the main uh, activity was actually re fairly reasonable, just fencing cows out of the stream and you got this very rapid recovery. Another thing we have to do is improve environmental flows below dams. Uh, you know, you know, our rivers do dry up below dams or as, as they get very low, uh, or become so low it changes the habitat for the fish. We need to have flows below dams that support fish, fish and fisheries. Uh, and this is a major issue because we have so many dams in California. There's hardly a stream in the state that doesn't have one or more dams on it. This is a, an ongoing study, actually we're just finishing up now, of uh, evaluating 1,400 large dams in the state. Uh, with, uh, and we, it's been narrowed down to about 200 candidate dams where flows could be improved for fish. And then we're working on some case histories as well. Uh, it demonstrates that there's a lot of opportunities in California for improving flows below dams to benefit fish. And the fact we have the legal tools to do this, these are widely ignored, but the fish actually have rights in California. Uh, in, indeed, legally, you're supposed to maintain uh, habitat for fish below dams at all times. And this is some very old laws that are on the books, but very rarely enforced. And now increasingly we have to rely on the Endangered Species Act, which is a pretty draconian measure actually. Dam removal, of course, is another thing that's continually being looked at. There are some obvious dams, like Batilla had the dam on the Ventura River to remove for steelhead. Uh, but dam removal has to be considered because this map shows all the areas which are listed, showed in red here, that are above dams that used to be accessible to salmon and steelhead and other migratory fishes that are no, now completely cut off by the dams. Um, and, and in the Central Valley, 70% of our anadromous salmon habitat is above the dams. And one part of this conservation strategy is to figure out which dams can you remove uh, in order to act, provide access to upstream areas for these fish. Because most of these, the, remember, none of these dams have ladders on them that for fish to climb. Another thing is to manage floodplains. We've just begun to realize that our native fishes are really well adapted to floodplains. This little box in the bottom there shows salmon that were reared on a floodplain versus salmon that were reared in a river. Uh, they grow about two or three times as fast or more on the floodplains. And it's just a matter of providing them access to it because they know how to get on and they know how to get off. And one of the key floodplain areas that we're currently studying and is being looked at as, uh, for management for native fish is the Yolo Bypass, which you can see Sacramento in the background here. Uh, well, how do you do all these things? Um, 
how do you make a system work uh, where you've got such drastic things you have to do? Well, I think we need to adopt a whole new approach to conservation, which is called reconciliation ecology. Reconciliation ecology recognizes that um, humans dominate all ecosystems. We're in charge. We're, we're the dominant species on this planet, and it doesn't matter where you go, we're there. Uh, most ecosystems are also novel ecosystems, which means there are mixtures of native and non-native species in altered habitats that creating ecosystems that have never existed before. We've created new ecosystems, and we have to understand how these systems work and how we can manage these systems so they benefit the species we want, in this case, native fishes. Um, and drought and climate change are just increasing the need for this, this general approach of recognizing that, that we need to take charge and really figure it, make, this, make the hard decisions about how we, what, we, what species we want around in the future. And the, our big question then becomes, how do we incorporate conservation into human-dominated ecosystems? Obviously, from what you've heard, this is not going to be easy. And I, I'll finish up, though, though this with a uh, sh very short case study of one of my favorite places, which is Peter Creek, Lower Peter Creek, which flows past the Davis campus. Um, this is a a creek which is regulated by dams uh, in the reach below cam uh, flows by campus by the Pewter Creek Diversion Dam. It's basically a 30 kilometer long riparian shred. That is, you got this deeply incised creek that meanders through a heavily agricultural landscape uh, and is a major sort of place for fish and wildlife in, the, in this region. But it's an incredibly novel ecosystem. It's a mixture of native and non-native species, as I'll show. But it's also a model for, as a, for a reconciled aquatic and riparian ecosystem. And what you might notice here, this is a picture taken this February before we had our, 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 our meager winter rains this year. And you notice there's still water in the creek. Uh, this creek has been flowing steadily all through this drought period. This is because it's a managed stream and it's managed to produce water for drought, under drought conditions. So here's a photo of the stream. Uh, what you can see, this is not a natural habitat. This is why it's a novel ecosystem. It's this narrow ribbon of habitat with dikes on both sides going across one of some of the, going through some of the best agricultural land in the world that's very intensively farmed. Uh, and you look at the species that occur here, this is a really wild mixture of native and non-native species from all over the world. Uh, even you look at plants, for example, the, the weeds, you know, 61% are uh, non-native species. 63% uh, of the fish are non-native. The amphibians, the third, are non-native and so forth. So you, what you see is that this is a system that contains a lot of non-native species and it's a mixture of both in this very altered environment. But by changing the flow regime, this was the result of a lawsuit, and I won't get into the details, but we essentially created a more natural flow regime below the creek, of which the first priority, of course, was keeping the creek alive uh, under all conditions. Uh, but this natural flow regime was designed to enhance native fishes at a very low water cost. And what you see, this is a before and after diagram, a very crude one, but it shows, shows you that before the high flows were instituted, uh, we had a system stream, stream that was largely dominated by alien species. Once we created a natural flow regime, that, or a flow regime, I should say, that, man, that favors native fishes, that abruptly switched to about 80% natives in these areas. And what's interesting to me is that alien species did not go away. They just became much less abundant. So what does it take to manage Peter Creek as a reconciled ecosystem? Looking at this as an example for, of streams throughout California or, or regulated rivers. Well, it takes vision, of course. You have to really look at this stream and say, what do you want in the long term? And we, this vision was expressed in, in a, a, the Peter Creek Accord in this case, which was a result of the lawsuit. It'd be nice if we didn't have to go through a lawsuit to get water in our streams. It took, uh, takes water agency cooperation. The, the Solano County Water Agency is now a very proud cooperator uh, in managing the stream. Uh, one of the best things is a stream keeper is a full-time employee now of the water agency whose job is to look after Pewter Creek, after, look at the conservation, raise money for restoration projects, work with landowners, do everything he can 
to, to make the stream as good a place for native fish and wildlife as he possibly can. It involves community involvement. The, the towns along the creek are involved. We have a, a, an environmental group, the Peter Creek Council, that's very deeply involved in, in restoration activities. Of course, it takes landowner cooperation. Most of the land along the creek is privately owned. And it needs monitoring. Indeed, part of the accord agreement was that this water agency would pay for monitoring of the fish and wildlife along the creek so we know what's going on. This is a very, and it's working. That's the bottom line. Uh, not easy, but it's working. And obviously, money is needed, and lots of it. Um, uh, on, and this is a matter of considering this to be an investment in the future. Uh, there's so much to be gained if you can avoid getting fish as listed as endangered species. And there's so much to be gained by having streams that flow through neighborhoods that people like to go down to. Pewter Creek was a mess before the Accord. Now it's a place people like to go down to see the fish, to recreate, to watch the otters or, what, or whatever else. I recommend a blog that was written by Jay Lund et al. Uh, of our watershed center on about how we're giving away fish flows for free during droughts when we really should be paying for that water. Water that belongs to the fish really should be paid for. So the conclusions then is systematic actions are needed to save California's endemic fishes. We can do it. Uh, we need them in the short term. This drought's apparently going to get worse before it gets better and they may take some emergency action in the not too distant future. We need more places like Pewter Creek, which has a net, right now the flow regime that acts as a refuge for native fishes. We know climate change is accelerating the rates of decline. We, are, we can see uh, extinctions on the horizon if we don't really do something. Uh, and this 2012-14 drought is an example of what is to come. And by that, again, it's only if we let present trends continue. And I can't emphasize that too much. We, if we're going to think of ourselves as being reconciliation ecologists, we can really make our systems work and work in ways that are uh, good for people and good for the fish and, and our rivers. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to uh, entertain questions by email or by whatever other means you would like to contact me. Thank you.